Good evening and welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Corney and it is my great pleasure to present the Handspring Puppet Company. Sculptors, puppeteers, authors, actors, producers and directors Basil Jones and Adrian Kohler here on my left and then further um, to the right of the stage Yvette Christiance, a poet, and Dan Herlin, a puppeteer. I do so on behalf of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at Parsons and the Vera List Center for Art and Politics here at the New School for General Studies. And I do so on occasion of War Horse, Handspring Puppet Company's acclaimed new play that will open at Lincoln Center tomorrow night. Each public event is occasion to reaffirm with you, our audience, shared interests in how aesthetic practices relate to political issues. Every now and then an extraordinary opportunity comes along that allows us to go further and to truly grow and tonight's encounter with puppetry represents just such an opportunity. Founded 30 years ago in Cape Town, South Africa under apartheid, Handspring Puppet, Puppet Company has created plays and operas that have been presented at over 200 theaters throughout the world. The company has developed a rich performance art language, entirely their own, by drawing on African, Asian, and European traditions and infusing them with an extraordinary degree of specificity. And specificity, um, I, by, by that I mean a keen awareness of the political and cultural context in which the work is being presented, where at times certain things are best articulated by the puppet, such as the subjectivity of an animal or the witness accounts that were part of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's proceedings. War Horse is evidence of both, the engagement with political constellations and an analysis of the nature of puppetry itself. I am delighted that Basil Jones and Adrian Kohler are joined and we with them tonight by two much admired New Yorkers that will frame the discussion and the work um, around Handspring's work. They are Dan Herlin, um, in the center of the stage, a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow, the director of the graduate program in theater at Sarah Lawrence, and a puppeteer whose productions have won Obie, Species, and many other awards. The other New Yorker who is joining us tonight is Yvette Christiansen, the South African-born, New York-based poet, novelist, and scholar, visiting professor at Barnard and associate professor at Eng in English at Fordham University. She is the author of two collections of poetry and a novel, Unconfessed, which was a finalist in the Hemingway Penn Prize for First Fiction. Christiane has also followed and accompanied the work of Handspring Puppet Company for many years, and she will now open the discussion of it with some introductory comments. Basil Jones and Adrian Kohler will follow with their own presentation, and then we will reconvene in a roundtable discussion, all four of them. I'd like to thank the team at the New School that made this uh, evening possible. Uh, there's Radhika Subramanian, who is the director of the Sheila C. Johnson Design Center at Parsons, that I'd like to acknowledge. Um, Brian Case, head of AV Services, Annie Shaw at the Virilis Center for Art and Politics, and Pam Tillis, director of public programs. I'd like to thank you for coming, and now please join me in welcoming our wonderful artists and speakers. just stand here to do this introduction and then, and then I will sit down. Um, there's an, uh, an early moment in War Horse, the Handspring Company's collaboration with the National Theatre, when the cult named Joey makes a wonderful horsey sound, has a name, it's called the blow. It's really an exhalation through the nose with the mouth closed. And at first I was not sure where the sound actually came from when I first looked at that cult, because the cult looked as it was like a animal that had been made of wood and I believe barely beige stockings. Um, a beautiful simulation, an object, a contraption that had just come on stage and I and others in the audience were just getting used to it and learning how to look at it. And our first question was, can it become real? Will it become real for us? 
and then the blow. But where did the sound come from? Later, the grown joey makes the same sound, and that other extraordinary horsey sound, it's called the nicker. It's that vibration that comes from the horse's vocal cords, but it's caught between the cheeks of the closed mouth. Quick, where did that sound come from? And before you can figure it out, there's that accompanying toss of the head, and while you're watching the horse, because now it is a horse, just as it was a colt, you realize that you've glimpsed something else, a movement just to the side in the cheeks of someone. And it's someone who's in front of you but already disappearing. It's a puppeteer. And again the blow, and yes, there's a barely discernible movement, and yet the sound does not only come from the puppeteer. It is somewhere in between, and in between, it has been freed from the puppeteer, and it's already found its home in the lungs you know are Joey's. In truth, the sound in Warhorse is made by the three puppeteers who operate the colt and the grown Joey. They, they operate the horse together with another horse. Uh, I always want to call him Topsoil, but he's not. He's Top Thorn. Thorn. Yeah. Top Thorn. He's magnificent. Wait till you see him. And these three puppeteers, I realize, are true conspirators. Conspirator from conspirari, to breathe together. And what the puppets conspire to do is to vanish, to give their breath to another, to close their own mouths, avert their own eyes from the audience, in fact, to deface themselves in order for the creature to look, to communicate, in order for us to come face to face with this, to encounter a radical being, a radically different creature, and to accept its breathing language. And this breathing language is what Adrian Kohler and Basil Jones have been doing formally since 1981, 30 years when they founded their own company, seeing in objects some potential, something kinetic, some, some waiting animation, and not always ready to draw them into the safety net of what I'm doing now is speaking a language that I've learned. Their successes are so many. Some of you might remember Ubu and the Truth Commission, and the scriptwriter for that is Jane Taylor, who's in the audience tonight. And she's the, um, I believe, the, the director of the Handspring Trust. And their awards are many. M most recently, the Olivia, the Evening Standard, and the Critics Circle Awards in England for Warhorse. And if I could speak a bit now about Dan Herlin. Um, um, Karen Quoney has, has told you a little of what, where his academic home is and some of his many awards, which include the Guggenheim and the United States um, uh, Artists Award. I believe there are only 50 artists awarded this annually. And, and I believe he's also a winner of an o o Obie Award. But I just want to say something about Dis Farmer. It is a play, a puppet, that, that is based on the real person, an Arkansas photographer named Mike Meyer, who was known for being one of the most curmudgeonly grumpy people on the planet. But he also was a photographer. And every weekend, people would come into Arkansas, I believe it was Heber Springs, Heber Springs, and they would go to buy their groceries, to do their shopping, and they would drop in to be photographed by him. And apparently sometimes he'd say well, with a cigarette in the corner, he'd say, well, you keep still now. I just keep still. Apparently he was that kind of person. <laughs> and um, I believe it was in the 1970s, quite a few years after he had died, someone discovered his collection of poetry. And they found themselves coming face to face with some of the most moving photographs of Arkansas rural people. And Herland's Dis Farmer follows this character. He'd, um, Maya had called himself Dis Farmer, and I'm, I'm hoping that Dan will speak a little bit about why. But in the, in the play, and I think it's okay to give this away, there's something that happens to this puppet. There are five puppets. They all look exactly the same but they get smaller and smaller. You don't realize this, the audience is watching the puppets switch, and you think you're seeing the same thing, but gradually this figure in front of you is shrinking. And I think that what Dan achieved in that is again a different vanishing that replicates that of Dis Farmer himself, which I think is the true, true aim of the artist, which is to disappear. And now, 
in my role now, I will do what the Mbongi, the praise singers in Zulu do. They say, Titi Lile, meaning I vanish. While, while Basil goes and gets the notes he left in the green room, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about how we come to be standing here on this stage. Uh, when we, we, we've always performed in all of our plays before, um, but with Warhorse, it was the first time that we were not scheduled to be on the stage, mainly because it was quite a big production and it was felt that uh, we would be more useful outside of the puppets. And, it, and it, in a sense, it was a huge liberation for us. First of all, the scary part was that we didn't really know how to teach puppetry. We'd been doing it for about 25 years. Um, but we'd always done it, we'd always trained people in the context of a rehearsal and alongside of ourselves as we progressed through the rehearsal process. Uh, and suddenly, we had to formulate what our principles were uh, of puppetry, and we initially could only come up with four. Um, eventually, after quite a bit of thinking, we've got about 15 now, um, <laughs> and, and we take people through those 15 in, in, the, in the initial training period whenever we remount the show. Uh, and I guess today is an extension of, of that, of the discussing what it is that puppeteers do with this um, sort of strangely growing art form in, in the early 21st century. So it's kind of a little bit, what's the offer? Why puppets? Um, what, do, what, what, what do they give the theater that is slightly special, somewhat different to uh, what an actor does? Um, and, but I'd like to begin um, by talking a little bit about what the theater is itself. What is special about the theater as a place um, for us to work in? Uh, how does it differ from, say, performing on the street? And <clears throat> the way I think of the theater is somewhat as a place where extreme perception can take place. Um, Temple Grandin, in her book on um, on autism called Animals in Translation, talks about this extreme perception, something, a form of perception that autistic people have. Um, there's a kind of a rush of, of stuff that comes at them uh, through the eyes, through the ears, through um, the skin that they can't, in a way, mediate. Um, and she talks the same about some animals um, who also have extreme perception. We have essentially the same brains, but animals tend to have um, not such a big frontal lobe as we do, not such a well-developed frontal lobe. Our frontal lobe filters a lot of the perception that comes into um, our, our heads and only lets us be aware of, the, of those things that it can make sense of. Autistic people, to some extent, have a problem because there's no filter. They just have to deal with a tremendous amount of sensory overload all the time. But what I think, um, what I think Temple Grandin is saying in her book is that we do have the ability to see and hear extremely finely. And I think that the theater creates a place where we can see and hear extremely finely. And the theater does that by blocking out external uh, sound and uh, blocking out light and only lighting certain aspects of the stage. So what we're, kind of, what we're kind of saying, what our central conceit is, is that the audience does have extreme perception. And anything that you do on stage, anything that you do, um, is, is perceivable to the audience, even if the audience is right at the very back of the auditorium. Um, so starting from that, and this is something that became, we became aware of very particularly when we were doing War Horse, when for the first time Adrian and I moved to the other side of the footlights, so to speak, 
we weren't performing in the show, we were watching what was happening and helping to direct what was happening. We, we saw very clearly that when a puppet breathes on stage, it is indeed perceptible from the back of the auditorium, even the back of the Olivia Auditorium, which is a very big auditorium. You can see that very, very tiny movement. Um, and that's sort of, do you want to say something, Adrian? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the breathing, of course, is, is, is the vital thing. And we'll talk a little bit later about how we've put breathing into figures. We've got a couple that we brought with us that were OK to fit in a suitcase. Um, the, the, the breathing and, and also, but w taking a step earlier than War, uh, War Horse to our very first collaboration with the artist William Kentridge. We did a, a production of Wojciech on the Highfelt where we weren't quite sure. Uh, Wojciech, uh, the Buchner play, is an ideal vehicle for puppet theater in the sense that it has very few words. Each scene is not much longer than a page. And, uh, and there are quite a number of short scenes um, with, with very, very pared down, carefully thought out words, which uh, encapsulate quite complex thoughts. Um, but we needed to show the audience how the puppet was thinking. William came to us because he was interested in his, uh, developing his animation, which has grown into what he calls now uh, drawings for projection. But then he called it Stone Age animation. Um, where he had a piece of paper on the wall and would draw and would walk back and would take a picture and would draw again and uh, walk back, take a picture and rub out and all that. And eventually uh, projected, it moved. Um, but animating a human being or a complex a subject in the foreground was, took a long time. And he thought perhaps puppets could play that role uh, and came to us. And, um, and he, he said, well, I'm going to animate the settings of the play and the, the puppets will be the subjects of the scene. And what quickly came to our attention was that the animated screen could both show landscapes, which were relatively easy to animate, but they also could show the thoughts of the puppet. And, uh, and we've got a, a clip here from the 1992 production uh, uh, of, of Wojciech laying the table for the captain. He's employed by the captain. Now, in the Buchner role, for instance, he shaves the captain. Those of you who know the play, he, there's a scene where uh, Wojciech is uh, a very lowly paid uh, soldier in, in the original play of the captain. Uh, and he works for the captain. And in the morning, he has to shave him. And he doesn't like the captain. Um, and so the, the, the trick of the scene is that it's a dangerous scene. He's got this cutthroat razor, and he's so close to the life forces of the captain. And one little convenient slip of the knife, and he could do what he really wants to do. Uh, but with a puppet, a knife, and a wooden neck uh, didn't seem to have much drama in it. <laughs> uh, and so another scene was invented uh, where Wojciech is laying the table, and what the, what the captain wants the table to look like. And what Wojciech is trying to do uh, are at odds with one another. He doesn't quite know where the knife and fork should go. And the, and, the, and the bottle of wine and the glass, they take on a menacing presence in that particular scene. And Wojciech is trying to sort it out in his head. Um, and um, we were trying to find out, well, how can we show the audience that this, this puppet is thinking? And Maybe we should show the clip, and then you can decide whether he's thinking or not. Uh. <laughs> it was working. <laughs> Sylvan. Uh. Right, I'll just go escape, and then I'll go, oh, there's something, right.
okay. The way we worked on the thought was that we, we, we did pauses between the movement and we allowed the video to kind of shift and dictate uh, what, what was might be going on in his head and in his head and then and then he moved again and he made so hopefully in that process you saw his thoughts changing. And I'm gonna hand over back to Basil now because I've talked a while. I guess what one of the things that that is peculiar to puppet theatre and is strong in puppet theatre is that when you when you subtract the words from a scene um, other forms of language uh, come to the fore. One of the things that we're really interested in is what kinds of language exist that we use without knowing that we use them. Um, and certainly the language of movement is, is one of those, those languages. It's um, a language that I, it's slightly different from, from the languages in, in uh, the language of the movement that we've been talking about in theater um, recently, we, we have object theater and um, movement theater and physical theater. I think of, of the movement language that, you, that we use as a kind of language of negotiation and touch. Um, it's, it's about how objects move around one another and how objects touch one another, how characters touch one another, and how characters touch and interact with other objects on stage. I think that there's a slightly different language at work there, and it's for us one of the important and interesting languages of, uh, of puppet theater. Um, but to, to go backwards a little bit, um, this process that, that we are involved in the kind of alchemy, the, the turning of nouns into verbs is I think one of the essential things about puppetry. We, we make objects come alive um, and that struggle to live is what is behind the breath and why the breath is so, I think, so important. Um, we think of the puppet as being phenomenologically different to the actor on stage. Because for us, um, the actor struggles to die, whereas for us, the puppet struggles to live. And part of that struggle to live is, in fact, the breath and the breathing. Um, that's the beginning of, of that struggle. And something that we see in, in Dan Herdland's work and uh, that we, we also very involved with in our own work is that kind of um, the, the, the struggle of the everyday, the struggle just to reach forward, pick up a glass, and drink from it, and put it back down again. Um, those things are s apparently really easy to do. But in fact, sometimes I think we all recognize that they're quite difficult. Um, getting out of bed, for instance, is sometimes a really difficult thing to do emotionally. On a Monday. Um, but, but physically, it's not a problem. Um, embracing somebody that you may not want particularly to embrace, but feel obliged to, could be your mother. Um, uh, that's another simple human action that becomes really problematic sometimes. And there are many of them. Our lives are full of them. And I think that when we see puppets doing them well on stage, um, as Dan's puppets do, um, it sort of ennobles them. It, it ennobles those, um, the everyday, the quotidian. Um, and for us, is kind of central to what's happening on stage when, when puppets are on stage. And, um, what, 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 what can happen is that the audience can get so absorbed by, those, by watching those simple actions and loving to see those simple actions being performed by the puppet that it sort of forgets to hear the dialogue. Um, so you quite often have an audience walking out of a puppet piece saying, lovely puppets, pity about the dialogue, hey? Um, 
And I've heard that too many times to actually believe it anymore because I think that what happens, quite often the dialogue is fantastic dialogue. It could even be Wojciech. The Buchner dialogue is magnificent. But I think um, there's a different kind of perception that clicks in when, when you watch those, those very, very simple things in a puppet piece. I call it the ur drama, the, the, the overarching drama of any piece, which is that very, very simple stuff. It doesn't almost matter what the narrative, the, the, the more obvious narrative is, or even what's being said. What, what you get sort of sucked into is the, the micro-movement, what we call the micro-movement of, uh, of the puppets. I don't know if that the makes sense The micro-movement of everyday life. The micro-movements of everyday life, yeah, yeah, of the quotidian in, in everyday life. I think what Basil is saying about the Ur story is that, that almost every puppet play tells the same story, the, 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 the struggle to live of that particular figure. Whereas at the actor on stage, when they die, you don't really believe it. Um, you, might, you might believe that the, the, the wooden figure is striving to, to live, and in that, in that moment, you feel flattered because he's trying to be like you. So when, you, when you're dealing with a human uh, puppet on stage, uh, a puppet of a human being that would be talking and does in fact talk quite a bit of the time perhaps, um, uh, this, this, these two um, levels of, of signing, the signing coming out of the verbal side of things and maybe the, the, the general choreography where someone goes and does something on stage, um, that's one level of signing. And the micro, micro movement, which is this other level of signing, um, you may not be aware of the, the um, separation of the, of the two. But when it comes to a horse or an animal on stage where the horse is just being a horse, um, that micro-movement is, is much more important, much clearer, because there are no words for you to listen to and interpret. So the audience is hungrily having to, uh, to read, try to read any signing that the horse can give to, to you. So a twitching ear, uh, a stamp of the foot, uh, a switch of, switch of the tail, all those things you, you hungrily trying to read and interpret. Um, so Adrian has kind of uh, designed in a sort of a grammar, in a way, of, of possible movement for the, for the horse and possible m meaning. And you as the audience are um, authorially making that meaning for yourselves as you watch the puppet uh, move on stage. So when we're talking to the puppeteers, we're saying, be careful because every movement that you do on stage, the audience will try to interpret. And so if you do a movement on stage that is arbitrary, the audience will nevertheless try to interpret that arbitrary movement and probably come up with nothing um, or misunderstand what's going on. And so your arbitrary movement becomes noise. Um, yeah, noise is one of the principles, the 15. <laughs> Don't produce it. Um, so um, we're 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 kind of we're moving towards. Um, we're going to keep this this section fairly short. We, we're yeah, nearly yeah, we're nearly yeah. at an end. But we we with our movement and uh, with our movement philosophy, we're moving towards a slightly radical and cheeky um, proposition, and. That assertion is that movement is thought. Um, quite, a, quite a cheeky thing to say. Um, and we kind of alluding to that with the movement of Wojciech when he's trying to uh, lay the table. We kind of saying that, that thought and the body are not two separate things. That thought exists in your very actions, in the way you walk in the way you smoke a cigarette. Um, those, those are thoughts. The way you dance um, is, is a thought. It's a way of being, it's a way of thinking and a way of communicating those thoughts. So if you, and that's a fairly easy thing to buy, that, that, um, that thought can exist in dance. 
But we are also saying that thought can exist in, in the movement of, of a puppet, the way the puppet walks, the way the puppet um, uh, shakes hands with, some, with another puppet. You can, there's a thought involved in the way you shake a, uh, shake a hand. It's a language. A language as well. As a th well, a thought has to be part of a language. Uh -huh. um, there, yeah. Um, Andrew Macklin, who's a, um, uh, an architect who's interested in the phenomenology of, um, of movement, um, wrote to me, uh, he's, he's based in Sydney, he said, what phenomenology is saying is that the body thinks before language or concepts. It creates meaning in an immediate act. It is itself a language, both before verbal written language and in a feedback loop based on that very language. So when a puppeteer creates meaning with a puppet, we have a language beyond verbal language upon which meaning is based. We, we are not at all against words in puppet theater. Um, and we, we love the idea of, for instance, doing a, a very word-rich Tom Stoppard piece that just uh, is, is filled with words. We think it's an amazing challenge that puppets could, uh, could deal with. Yeah, indeed, the Canadian puppeteer Ronnie Burkett is non-stop words. But, but we also are aware of how language has, in puppetry, um, somewhat constrained the art form, I think. We, um, we're aware of it as, as being something that can sometimes be rather tyrannical, um, particularly when writers write a puppet play thinking that it's, uh, it's language-based. We, we're learning how to write plays, write plays, um, more in a, in a French way of thinking. Uh, when, when we have, in English, we have the word audience, whereas in French, we have the word um, spectacle for a play as something, and spectateur, um, which is, is, a, is another word for an audience. The, the French uh, way of thinking of the play is a little bit more as something that you see rather than as something that you hear. Um, so we, we are in, we're in the middle of a, of a, a dialogue with words. We, we feel that movement is perhaps a more fruitful place for puppetry to come out of. And we are trying to make some um, assertions that um, movement, and particularly micro-movement, is um, the fruitful place from which puppetry um, can grow. Shall we? So, is uh, there... Yeah, the, the, the next part of the presentation is to show you a little bit about the evolution of the puppets that, that went before War Horse. Um, we, we did a TED talk recently and we brought a hyena, so that one is here too. Um, um, but we have also a chimpanzee. We, we've been working, uh, the, the, the hyena was originally part of a production called Faustus in Africa, uh, a huge chopping about of the Goethe text. Uh, the Goethe text is quite a long play, and we, we cut it down to an hour and a half, um, both halves, or both, both plays that make up the Faustus. Um, and in the holes that were cut, uh, a South African poet uh, wrote new work in, in, the, in the style of Goethe, Le Sejo Ram Polo King. Um, and uh, Helen of Troy, uh, in our version, has to play drafts with a hyena, which is a minor devil. And the important movement that the hyena needed was a paw, an articulated paw, that could move the, the, the dice, the draft pieces. So we're going to move over to the table there. And Sylvan, if you can give us a little bit of light. It's a very old puppet. It was made in 1994. And it's it's quite battered, um, and it looks like a piece of junk. Thank you. 
a long time since we did it. The puppet is not uh, entirely unlike the horses in that uh, it has these ribs which are made out of plywood. In the case of the horses, just going back, going boing boing. In the case of the horses, um, these ribs are made out of cane. Um, and it has a spine. Um, in the case of the horses, the, the spine is made out of aluminium. And it has uh, the, the pantyhose, uh, uh, barely beige, um, <laughs> which in the case of the horses is uh, a stretch it's, Georgette. It's, yes. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, of history, in a way, of where the horses came from, and particularly this I'll, front I'll, leg. I'll demonstrate how it works. Uh, this hyena can only work in one direction, because all the controls come out the back. Um, so it always enters that side and side. exits that way. Um, so I, I, I'll just turn slightly sideways here, and you can see my right hand here is there's a, there's a silver lever there, and when I pull that, there's a, a, a string that runs through the, the figure and down the other side. But the real important thing are, are these two strings on either side, which passively, when I pull the string from the back, it, it passively w works the hoof, um, the, the paw. Um, and, and that's the movement that became the, the, the automatic lifting of the hoof of the horses, which is so characteristic of what a horse movement looks like. Um, without it, it doesn't look really like a horse. Um, Okay, so this was 1994. In the year 2000, we, we were, were searching for a project. We, we did quite a lot of politically uh, uh, engaged work in, in South Africa in the sense that Wojtek was about the inequalities of the, the, the country that we grew, all grew up in. And uh, Wojtek was at the, at the lowest end of the heap trying to earn a living for his wife and baby. Um, and Faustus in Africa was about the compromise in 1994 when the perpetrators of the state were in, in many cases uh, set free, uh, uh, scot free, and Ubu and the Truth Commission was about the, the, the amazing testimonies that came out of the Truth Commission process. And by, by the year 2000, political theater in South Africa just couldn't draw an audience at all. Um, nobody was interested in in the, in, the, in the protest style that we all grew up in. And so we decided to do a philo philosophical piece about for the year 2000 when all of us were thinking we were all about to turn over a new leaf. Um, you remember the problem with computers that never happened. <laughs> um, and we did a piece about chimpanzees um, and about sign language. Um, a group of chimpanzees had been taught human sign language and one of these chimps was taken back to Africa in an attempt to Sorry. Sorry. Re I'm just, just rewild, rewild the animal. Um, and the question that we asked with the play was would it perhaps be possible for a chimp who had learnt human sign language to spontaneously um, uh, teach its offspring or other chimps if it were to return to the wild and what would the, the implications of that be? We, we didn't know whether this could actually occur and we went to Tanzania to Jane Goodall's uh, amazing uh, Gombe Stream uh, National Park where, she, where she's established the chimp, uh, where she's looking after the chimp colonies that exist there and um, people have been tracking chimps there for 40 years, have a tremendous amount of knowledge about, uh, about their actual behavior. And we said, would it ever be possible for a chimp that had been in the city uh, with perhaps these language skills to be rehabilitated into a wild troop of chimpanzees? And they said, absolutely not. In, any chimp coming in would be killed because they were not known and, and they, they were somehow had other qualities that were not wild. And they said there was one little loophole and that was if that particular chimp was a female and it had come originally, it had been captured from a wild troop and came back and was in estrus at the time. So fertile and ready to, to, to reproduce. That would be the one loophole. 
that the chimp would be allowed back into the troop. So we, of course, pounced on that and wrote a whole story about it. <laughs> and this is Lisa the chimp. Um, She has various capacities. There's, there's sort of a wrist action here that can, you know, there was sign language and we did, we, we, we were able to perform basic sound la sign language with, of course, surtitles on the screen so that people <laughs> could actually read it. <laughs> um, and and there, were, there were, yeah, it, it's a two-person figure. The, the legs can also be worked uh, from, from an upstage control here. So it, um, and it's also still covered in barely beige pantyhose. Uh, um, in designing the puppet originally, I, when, we, when we observed the chimps at Gombe Stream, the, the, fig, the, the chimps spent a huge amount of time doing social grooming, um, sitting around in, in, in groups just picking through the fur. And I, I thought, well, that's, is it, fur is a very important element of the puppet, surely, because there's going to have to be social grooming in the story, seeing that's what they do most of their lives. And, um, and my first prototype of the figure had a lot of fur on it, and, and the, the puppet seemed to disappear. It didn't look very nice. It looked like an old broom. And um, I pulled the fur off again, and I left it raw like this. And, and when the light shined on the, on the, on the pantyhose uh, directly from above or from behind, it starts to light up like a lantern, and you can see the levers and things that go on inside the head. Um, here's one for the, the upper lip. And there's one for the jaw. And there's this control for the, the other head, coming I mean, the head up and down. Um, basically, a modification of the human figures we'd made before. And, uh, but the chimp was a chimp as a chimp. It wasn't like the hyena who did talk in the play. And we, we moved on from this to, to the horses. I want to show some of the horses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, what I have here is a rehearsal clip of the fight that the horses uh, do in the, in the play. This, is, this was at a point in 2007 when we really didn't know that we had a show yet. Um, the, the National Theatre had put a lot of money into developing War Horse. There'd been several workshops and you know, we'd built a prototype um, and a lot of money had been sunk into some, a play that was about early 20th century plowing techniques and cavalry charges in the First World War, um, which you know, any sane producer would have gone like this to long ago. Um, but here is a, is a, is a moment in the play uh, when, uh, when the horses, the two main characters, uh, discover each other. 
and new. I'm just sorry. I'll go slideshow. Thank you. Yeah. I think the real reason why Basil and I weren't in wars was with the tremendous physical effort that's required to make, <laughs> to make these puppets work. Um, there, there are um, three people in, e in each horse and uh, the weight they're carrying and the, the enormous physical effort to unbuckle your, your backpack and to lift it up when it rears as well as get some kind of articulation in the front legs, uh, is, it does take a huge amount of strain, uh, strength and, and, and training, practice. But that's where we are with, with the, the progression of the puppets has, has led to, to, to these. You saw that the action of the hooves uh, and the, the breathing of the horses is, is, is achieved by the front operator bending his knees uh, in order for the, the rib cage to descend. Initially, when I was designing the horses uh, and watching real horses, I, so that when they were out of breath, the rib cage went like this. And I thought, well, how am I going to do that? You know, because there has to be a, a rigid bridge between the two manipulators so that somebody can ride them. And, um, and, and, uh, but the breathing is going like that, and they, it would require hinges of the ribs all the way down the spine. I cheated, and I swapped it around, and I made it an, a, a, an up and down movement, a little bit like we were doing with the hyena. Um, and the audience is none the wiser. They still see a horse out of breath, and, uh, and we don't need extra levers. I think one of the, the real surprises that came out of War Horse um, is this, this phenomenon that um, Yvette talked about, conspire, conspirare, this conspiracy of three, three people working together. Of course, we knew that the puppeteers would have to work together, but we never really realized um, how much they could do, how much they could give, how transformative their performances uh, could become. And um, that's, that's been a, a huge gift. It's, it's taken the, the, the admittedly beautiful puppets to another realm, I think. And, um, and it's it's the it's the thing that that really is beautiful and and growthful because it starts at a certain point at the beginning of a run, and as the performers do it more and more often, they they um, the fact that they don't need to talk to one another while they're working 
um, become stronger and stronger. Their bond becomes stronger and stronger. And that is a really beautiful thing to see. When a horse walks onto stage um, with a group of people who've been doing it for 100 performances, there's something quite extraordinary um, happening. You'll see it already for those of you who see the, uh, the horses now in, in New York. They've, they've done maybe uh, 10 or 12 performances. Uh, in, in the previews, they're already in a fantastic place. They came to the whole project with um, such goodwill and they, in fact, were already quite um, strong because uh, strength is an important thing if you want to um, uh, produce the, the performances that they are producing. But that, those performances are just going to strengthen and strengthen and that's something that we couldn't have predicted and is a great delight to return to when we go back to see the show after uh, a month or two away from it. Well, now's the chance to just like sort of stretch and yawn, and then we're going to gather in the middle of the stage and chat. So, um, questions. Questions. Um, thank you so much. I thought um, maybe we'll start with 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 the, with the question that built around a remark that I hear all the time. I don't know, Dan, if you hear this as well with with your your puppets, um, and that is uh, particularly after uh, Tall Horse, the the play that I've always called Girafa. But about the beloved his first name, the, the the story about the giraffe that is sent um, across Europe um, as a gift. Yeah, from from Egypt to, to the King of France. We must point at each other. They feel like the two horses. Uh, circus is in town. Okay. Um, that 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 that. That play, when, when, the, when the giraffe walked on stage at BAM, which is where I saw it, um, the audience immediately burst into tears. <laughs> and um, watching War Horse on Sunday, uh, people were just weeping all the way through the play. <laughs> um, I hated you. <laughs> 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 um, and it's not, it's, not, it's not the same as watching Lassie hurt her paw. Um, there's something else that is happening, and I wonder if you, if, if you, could, if you have any idea what it is that, that whether, whether, Dan, I don't know if this happens to you as well, but something happens when you're watching not an actor, in, and I can see Meryl Streep, and I can say, "Oh my God, the the the, the skill, the machinery," or, or watching a an extraordinary soprano or tenor. Oh my God, yes, yes, that voice is coming out of that creature. But something else is happening, watching the puppets, and maybe the animal puppets bring something home. Or what does it do? What, do? Do you have a theory for why you do this to us? Or what <laughs> <is> <laughs> I, I think that one of, the, one of the things that is happening is that it's unusual to see an animal as an animal on stage. It's one of the offers, I think, of the puppet theatre that, that we, we, we have lives with animals um, in our normal lives. We have dogs and cats around us. We, we, we have extremely important relationships with animals. Uh, some of us have anim uh, relationships with, with horses. And when you see an animal on stage for the first time as an animal, uh, as a major character in a drama, it's a very unusual thing. And I think that that's partially what people are responding to, the, the very unusual uh, situation of having an animal uh, portrayed as an animal, not as an anthropomorphized being um, on stage. That's a guess. Yeah, I mean, nobody cried with the chimps and nobody cried with the hyena. Um, uh, you know, I don't know what, why they didn't do the same work. Um, 
Um, it may be also because of a very ancient association that we have with horses. I think um, one of the things that we, we quite often uh, feel is that in a theatre, um, when an audience comes into a theatre, one of the things you do is you, um, you, you, you relax into that very ancient thing of allowing objects to have life. I think it's part of our, our religious DNA that we believe in animism, that things can live, that, that objects can have life, that typhoons can have life, um, that the world can have life. Um, and um, I think that that's one of the other things that's, that's happening, that, that something is coming to life, something a horse that we have this very ancient relationship is, is coming to life in front of your eyes. Yeah, and if there's somebody here who's got a better clue that, than we have, you know, about why, why you cry, Michelle, please say so. Yeah. <laughs> there's... Uh-huh. And these horses are so flat out. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Dan, do you have something? Well, I, I in my experience, I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't made, I haven't made puppet shows with animals, so mm. I, I don't, I don't know about that. But I yeah. do, I do, I do know that we, we actually screened a version of this farmer, um, to some uh, students of mine at Sarah Lawrence and a, and a. One of the students, sort of at the end, raised her hand and said, "Why do why am I suddenly why do I suddenly care about a puppet?" Mm. And she so she was moved. I mean, it's a sad story, but I think it has something to do with the distance between yeah. us. I think mm. um, I think it's that you know you um, if you watch Meryl Streep, you know, and you're watching mm. her and she's wonderful and she goes mm. like this, you just don't think anything about it. You think she's got a scratch in her nose and whatever. Mm. But if you see a puppet do this, mm. you immediately recognize it and you immediately claim it and you immediately go, oh, I know what that is. I have done that before. I have had an itch on my nose. Mm. And um, so in some ways, I think that puppets are actually, because of the distance between a puppet and us, they're actually better mirrors of who we are mm. um, than, than, um, than live actors. So I think that might have something to do with it, too. My guess is... And in terms of the animism idea, Eileen Blumenthal, in, in her book on uh, world puppetry, talks about um, how, um, how because of that, uh, puppetry is essentially a very transgressive art mm. because we're, um, we're constantly going back and forth between this line of life and death, mm. um, which is a, kind of a scary place. I also, I also think that we like puppets because they scare us. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the, there, there are puppets that do scare us, and, and horror movies get made about them. Um, <laughs> yeah. And but, 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 the, the, uh, the, these. So, so you have diff very different styles of puppetry. I, I, I think that well, well, in terms of uh, the tabletop puppetry, is your, is your, is although you, you change it. And yeah, I was wondering was if you could talk piece. about the difference between the way that that handspring puppet works and about how you. What kind? Uh, what are the differences, maybe, between the puppets that well, you create? Well, I, I, th I think that. Um, in I'm the sorry, we don't have the. I think it would have been great to have a video clip no, of this farmer. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but look at look it up on YouTube. Yeah. You can it's get on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Can, yeah. Here's a little clip. Uh, there's a couple of little clips. Um, oh wait, what was what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> What's the well, oh, what's the oh, I know. Um, I think, you know, I don't know how it is in South Africa. I've never been to South Africa. But um, here, um, we don't particularly have a, we don't have a tradition in this country of puppetry for adults. Our, our puppetry is primarily for young audiences. Um, and so, you know, being the Americans that we are, we just, you know, pillage every other <laughs> tradition. Um, <laughs> Same in South Africa. <laughs> So I, I, I don't, you know, this farmer was a, what, was a kind of a version of a tabletop piece because that was sort of the closest thing I could think of to an American form. And a tabletop uh, puppet is, um, just as it sounds, there's a, there's a table, it acts as the floor, 
and um, or the stage and the puppet you know acts out on the stage. Uh, in Dis Farmer, uh, I chose the the tabletop form because it seemed appropriate. But the piece before that uh, was about um, uh, called Hiroshima Maiden, about these uh, 25 women who survived the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and were brought to the United States in 1955 for reconstructive surgery. And for to tell that story, I went to Japan and I studied the bunlaku because it seemed like a kind of a no-brainer that that was the form that it should take. So I'm kind of, you know. I'm sort of shape-shifting in a way, and mm -hmm. I, um, you know, one last thing, which is, is that very few people I th that I know, anyway, decide at an early age that I'm going to grow up to be a puppeteer. There's one person I know, he's right there. <laughs> um, but everybody else I know came to puppetry through a kind of a back door. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people came from the visual art world, some people came from the engineering world, some people came from, you know, just all over the place. So I think, you know, and I, I'm the same. I came from a theater and a dance background. So I'm really working my way through finding out what my, um, what my voice is or what my, uh, where I belong in this art form. Um, and so to do that, I'm kind of, I'm ripping everybody else off for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so watch out. <laughs> I, I was wondering if I could go right to the to the deep, deep thing that maybe is one also one of the reasons why people responded to giraffe to the giraffe and to the tall horse, and that is that there are there are more than one puppeteer working those animals, um, and and they seemed so unstable. Um, you know, the giraffe getting her sea legs. For those of you who saw uh, the giraffe, there was a, the, the, these are animals at risk. Mm. Particularly in World War in World War One, and that and when I was watching War Horse, I was reminded of of a number of things, and um, uh, and I'll be disciplined and only talk about one at a time. And one was that reminded that World War One was something the likes of which had never been seen and has never been encountered, and that was that the true and final switch between the mechanical and the, the, these extraordinary new weapons of warfare. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's something, you know, in, in, in the moment when the tank confronts Joey, it's, and, and, and also where the horses get caught up in the barbed wire, the Boer War. The barbed wire came from the Boer War. Um, so, but but th that there's something that is happening about the relationship between humans and animals that, that, that is also surpassed. And, and is that also something about how we relate to each other. You know, I, I think you're touching on, on something that is, is there in, in the sense that for thousands of years, human beings were totally dependent on horse, horses. Every city had a hay market. You know, there, there was horse droppings down the street. Um, you know, the, 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 the environment was sort of conditioned to work with horses. It was the transport. Um, and and the First World War basically changed that. Um, you know, the, the statistics are that uh, as many horses as men died in the war, which meant that farms in rural England and rural France um, no longer had any horses, and, and the tractors and, and the, the, the automobile took over. Um, and I think that uh, loss that affected us all somehow still is echoed in our love of the beauty of a real horse. Um, that, that somehow, the, it, as you say, it's a beautiful creature. Um, and, and we no longer live with him. Uh, and that's part of that, the tragedy of the story, is that it was cut off from us right. by that war. Which, which takes me to another question, and that is when you're talking about the, the work of being a puppeteer, when you talk about the sheer physicality, of what is required of you. Mm. Um, I, I wondered um, if you could uh, say something, because it seems that there's also something deeply metaphysical. I don't want to say yet spiritual, um, I, I mean, or, 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 uh, but, but it seems something deeply metaphysical. And that, and that in part, it's, it's that, that kind of pacing of the interaction between the puppeteer and the puppet, which also asks for the puppeteer to submit 
to, to it, it's a deeply meditative state. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit, bit about this. I think I've heard, certainly um, Dan, I've heard or read uh, Basil and Adrian, you, you likened it at one point to, to a form of slavery. <laughs> um, and, and I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about this, why slavery or, or, or not in a, that spirit, language of spiritual possession because of the transfer of breath is what I'm thinking of. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, what I'm thinking, and maybe I'm wrong, is the metaphysics of, of being a puppeteer. Well, the, pup, the puppeteer quite often, in order to, um, to have the puppet looking comfortable and natural, mm -hmm. has to be in quite an uncomfortable and unnatural position themselves. Um, and so, to some extent, um, or here, for instance, you, you, the, the puppet is singing, right? And, and the puppet is looking around and singing. You, you're holding the puppet up here, but you have to crane around to see the puppet's face. Otherwise, if you can't see the puppet's face, you can't see the eye line of the puppet. You can't see where the eyes are looking. Mm -hmm. Immediately, the puppet looks strange if you can't see the puppet's face. So your whole body is, is twisted out of where it's comfortable. You have to, as a puppeteer, often uh, submit yourself to your craft. Um, and sometimes that submission involves pain. Um, and indeed, with, with a play like War Horse, there's quite a bit of pain sometimes. Um, and when, when Adrian and I do uh, perform The Return of Ulysses, and Adrian is Penelope, and I'm Ulysses, um, <laughs> We have a final scene in the, in, the, in the play when Penelope and Ulysses finally come together. And over a period of about 10 minutes, they slowly, very, very slowly um, come together at, uh, in the center of the stage. Um, that takes about 10 minutes. And in the last minute and a half, they kind of rise up like that. It's an incredibly painful thing to do, to hold a puppet up, a wooden puppet, particularly a heavy one made by Adrian, um, <laughs> for more than 10 minutes, um, while pretending that you are utterly in love and that there's no, no problem whatsoever. It's a little bit like a ballet dancer on point. Um, she looks like, uh, she has to look as though it's the most effortless and easy thing in the world Whereas when she takes her pumps off at the end of the show, there's blood in them. Um, and and uh, three years into her career, or 10 years into her career, she can hardly get out of bed in the morning. There's so much pain. So there is a form of slavery. There is a form of um, subjection. You have to put your whole being into this emotional prosthesis that you are, are working out there. Um, and um, so, in a way, you become the kind of supplicant. You become the, um, the devotee of this, this tyrannical god that is the puppet. I'm thinking of the negative things now. Um, <laughs> but it's true. It, there's, there's a lot of pain involved. And but but on, the, on the flip side of that is when the show goes well mm -hmm. um, and, and you're cooking with the audience, you actually don't feel the pain, and the show feels like it lasts five minutes. Um, there is that contradiction. I, when I was researching the bunlaku in Japan, I, uh, you know, the, in that tradition, you, it's passed on from father to son for generation after generation, and very few um, new people enter into it that aren't born into it. But there was one puppeteer who I interviewed who had uh, come into the National Theater of Bunlaku from not, was not born into it. And I asked him why he uh, was so interested in, in puppeteering, what drew him to it. And, and he said, because of the spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I was very confused by that because it's not a, um, you know, it's a, it's a secular art form in Japan. And, uh, and my, my experience of puppetry was more the kind of grunting pain that you were <laughs> describing. So I, I asked him what, what did he mean by the spirituality, and he said that he felt that when he was performing, he was channeling. Hmm. Um, and I began to think about puppetry that way as this strange kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm the least sort of touchy-feely guy you can imagine, but I began to actually think that there was something to that, that hmm. 
especially when I heard Matt Atchison talk about the experience of being a puppeteer was the same as being a witness, that um, you, you watch, um, you basically, are, your job as a puppeteer is to watch the puppet and to be the witness to it. And he doesn't talk at all about pushing it around in the space. He talks about a kind of a much more passive role, which reminded me of what Kanoku said about channeling. I, I, when, when I'm listening to you and, and when I watch puppets, I'm, I'm always reminded of something that, uh, as a poet, I always aspire to, and that is to, 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 yes, work with words, but the true desire is to be liberated from them. And the true desire is to really... Um, this is the thing I've always tried to teach my students, is that how, how the poet has to vanish first, but first the poet must accept the discipline and the reality of, of bearing language, mm. but then the language itself has to vanish. So the language itself has to kind of, it, it's a placeholder in some way, um, but really what it has to do is, is, is we, we talk about the line that has to breathe, and that's the, the breathing of the line is about a, a rhythm, uh, the, the way that the imagination will alight upon something. I think it's when you're talking about, when you're talking about Temple Grandin and how we filter out for, for the sake of a certain sanity. Mm. Um, but, but, but also it's what the poet is doing. The poet is aware of the cough, of the movement, of the light on your spectacles, of, of, of your spectacles, which I've already admired, but on the movement of your foot, on the shadow. What do you choose? Mm. What do you choose? to make a whole room come alive in one sentence or one line. Um, maybe you can't do that. The line has to then bear too much responsibility. But in the end, the language has to vanish so that the reader enters the room mm. and the reader will breathe mm. w with the poem. And, and um, I, I, when I watch the puppets, I sometimes think as the, as, the, as the... I can't figure out if it's the puppeteer who's like the poem who vanishes in order for something to be there, or whether it's actually the puppet that is, that is the, the presence and the absence. The puppet is the thing that we know has been given the, the puppeteer's breath, and yet it is also not there. Mm. Um, and and I, this, is, this is what is part of the, it's truly magical. Um, Maybe the puppet, the wood, and the joints, and the string, indeed. and all of that are the words of the puppet. And, in the, in the, and when they disappear in the, in the mind ah, of the viewer, yes. um, maybe that's when you, 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 yes. you've hit the groove. Yes. I love this, um, this dialogue that we're having with Yvette about language and disappearance of, of language. Because um, I, I love the thought that the, the words are here, that you read the words, and as they become realer and more uh, real, they kind of, you pass through them into a place where you inhabit them in a way mm -hmm. you almost forget them, mm -hmm. but yet you can bring them back mm -hmm. any moment. Um, and I think the same thing happens um, with, with, with puppetry. As, um, as you say, it's, it's a kind of an extremely Brechtian, alienated thing. You can, you can, always, um, you can always see the artifice. It's so apparent, mm -hmm. and yet um, you can also make that artifice disappear and you can then see something that's kind of beyond the artifice. Um, th there's a, I think there's a beginnings of a real dialogue for us um, in the connection between words and the way words work in a poem mm -hmm. and the way um, puppets work. And then, and then that, that, that in the end, the words are also about a form of movement as well, to move mm. the reader from the reader's here and now to the there and then, which is the here and now of the work, mm. um, which, which requires, um, and this is what I love about reading, it, it's, it's, it, it, one learns how to be generous all over again. One learns how to engage, to, to turn one's face, to orient oneself to something, toward another. Mm. Uh, and, 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 and then the puppets, um, you know, watching this farmer and thinking, this, 
this strange man walking, all, I, all I'm seeing, please go and look at the video of this farmer on YouTube. Um, and and you, you see these beautiful, I mean, I should d describe, this is the oh, no, ecstatic gesture <laughs> when it addresses the work of art in its presence. Um, but but where, where, where you, the, 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 the puppeteers are moving these um, platforms on wheels, and so he's just walking, but always where he's walking, the, the pavement arrives. Um, and, and the whole world of inside and outside, the things that would be there, they all just come alive, even watching it as on, on a video. Um, what, 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 I mean, maybe it's what the imagist said we, we, we do. We've been raised even within a grammar of associations. That, that there's a thingness, a streetness. If we see a puppet go through a door, well, there must be an outside there. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm wondering... Can you perhaps talk a little bit, Dan, about why the puppet is the sort of perfect Brechtian presence mm. on stage? Uh, I, I, you know, in, in Brecht's idea was that you, you never want the audience to forget that they're in a theater. You know, be, before him, it was all about illusion. It was all about, you know, um, making them forget who they were for a while and, and pretending that you're, you know, going back to Russia. And with Brecht, he always wanted to people uh, to remember that they were in a theater and that they were watching a, a work of artifice. And uh, the puppet, you, you buy into the life of the puppet, and simultaneously, you, you also realize that it's completely fake. And the, the fact that, the, what, that's, this is actually the, the main thing that attracts me to puppetry, is the fact that those two streams can be going in our heads simultaneously, mm -hmm. that these two mm -hmm. seemingly um, binary ideas mm -hmm. are actually not canceling each other out, mm -hmm. but are living together quite happily. Mm -hmm. that's, that's actually why I love what, you know, sometimes, sometimes I get irritated when I believe the puppet too much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want I, I want to see I want to see the workings of it. I want to see the puppeteers. Mm. Um, and very often, what will happen, and what happened in Dis Farmer, was that people expressed kind of amazement that they could that they could be watching the puppet and be watching the puppeteers at the same time, and that both layers were um, fulfilling. Well, uh, uh, the, 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 the part I saw that was extraordinary was this man was walking around a room and uh, gently different people were taking over as, as the manipulators uh, dealt with uh, walls and furniture. Mm. Um, but the man kept moving. He, kept, he, he had his sense of purpose and he was moving in a particular direction. But the agency was shared. Yeah. Um, yes. and, uh, and you enjoy that fact. Yeah. It's not like you don't see the, the, them, them taking over from one another. I, I, I always say to students that, that I, I think of puppetry as being exactly like dance, in, in, in a very similar way that you are talking about micro movement. That both dance and puppetry, that it's movement that's the primary means of communication. But I, I also stress um, to, puppeteer, to my students that um, there really, with puppetry, there are two levels of choreography going on simultaneously that need to be attended to. Yeah. One of them is the choreography of the puppet, and the other is the choreography of the puppeteers. And I think that they're both beautiful in their own right. Um, yeah, that's a good, uh, mm. a good thing to point out, because um, sometimes the empathy of the puppeteer can be too cloying and, too, um, and, and sort of be a little bit irritating. Um, the puppeteer can, can I'm, I'm guilty of it sometimes myself, um, there can be a sort of, a, a sort of reverence um, that uh, is, doesn't help. Um, <laughs> um, and so the, 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 it's important that the puppeteer is aware of their own body and the way they, um, it's, it's not good if you're too self-aware, but it is important that you realize you are part of what the audience is looking at um, as a puppeteer. And it's, it's certainly something when we did a, uh, a piece uh, in London called Or You Can Kiss Me with three, puppet uh, three puppeteers on each puppet. 
um, we, we had to be quite aware of, of how different people appeared on stage, um, not always the same and, and not always great. <laughs> there was a question. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I worked on that. Huh? Well, well, the question, uh, the question is, the are we question? familiar with the, the film, The Dark Crystal? Because the, the gentleman here worked on it. And what I saw in your film there is uh, what I remember before you. Developed from that developing uh, in London and in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in the dark crystal, you had those those very long-legged creatures, yes. which are not horses; they're not recognizable animals. So you had quite a fair amount of license. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is, which is, I think, a, a lovely way of actually segueing to ask a question like. What would be the limit creature puppet that you could imagine? What, what is the creature that you, that, that would, I mean, yes, there's a, there's a chimpanzee, there's a hyena, you've made humans. What, what, what would be the creature that would be the most challenging for you to imagine? <sighs> that, you, that would have to teach you a whole new language, a truly new language, and a truly new way of breathing. I'm just, this is a Yes, that's what I was. Mm. Right. We're going to have to ask you to speak in the mic or something. Yes, I think others can't hear. Yes. <laughs> Maybe just pass the mics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, come okay. Apart. Okay. But but maybe can you can you uh, can you in some way that those draw there are drawings of griffins there are drawings you go to Hieronymus Bosch my God do I have to look at Hieronymus Bosch yeah. before I go to sleep at night but I can't not look but 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 yeah. Well, I think I think really it's the story that, that makes makes the figure. I don't have a fantasy uh, of some yes. uh, of some creature that I'm really dying to make, uh, uh -huh. like a, a Christmas pudding or something. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I believe in Australia there's one called the magic pudding. But actually, but so 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 that is true. So 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 what animates you then is a narrative first. Mm. It's also like always. Um, there's a parallel for me teaching a student. Um, the student gets the last line of the poem. I, I love this line. I want it to be the last line of the poem. And then the entire poem is to fit that damn last line. And what you get is a creature that you have not yet imagined that comes from another planet. So, uh. so I don't know if that's the same. So, so, the, so, so for you, the puppets come alive because they were already in a set of relations. In, in a context. That, yes. Mm. I, I don't know if you yes. agree there. Yeah. Although, although I don't start, generally I don't start with a narrative. I, well, I, uh, it's sort of, uh, since a lot of my work deals with historical narratives, historical stories and political stories, I'll usually start with a story and then we'll kind of tease the narrative of the play out of yeah. the, the research rather than, I don't start with a script or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. I think there's a question yes, in the front. Would you, would you, you mind could, speaking in the microphone? Oh, you brother. can. <laughs> Brava. Uh, <laughs> but this is being... Uh, but but this can is you project in that direction? Okay. Uh, it's being recorded, and if anyone wants to ask questions... Please, please do. I'm going to come and stand here. <laughs> 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 Spielberg just finished the filming of War Horse. Were your horses in it? No. <laughs> uh, 
No, no, the, the, uh, it's a film, it's real horses. Puppets on film struggle. I mean, I know the Dark Crystal worked really well, um, uh, but, but no, I mean, real horses, you know, I, did, I do know that there are eight Joeys that are all dyed to look the same, but. <laughs> Thank you, there's a question. Was that? So brilliant. <laughs> um, I wanted to find out before the puppets, in terms of the process, is there a drawing? Lots of them for me. How about you? <laughs> Lots of them for me. <laughs> no, uh, a lot of drawings. I, I mean, uh, I, with the horses, I, I, I looked at horses a lot. And, um, and particularly helpful were skeletons, uh, real skeletons of horses. Um, you know, when, when you get the, the length of the limb right, then the movement of the leg is right. It looks like a horse. Um, the length of the chimpanzee's arms were very important in making the movement of the chimpanzee look a little bit like a chimpanzee. Um, those, those clues are useful. Um, so, and, 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 uh, and of course, with the drawing, you've got to fit a human being inside the horse and give them space to walk, as well as the horse trying to make it look at na natural walking around the person inside. Um, so there, there are modifications to the real horse that you've got to make in order to accommodate the manipulation of the figure. And then there are the scores, literally scores of working drawings, which are full-scale um, drawings which people in the workshop have to interpret, have to cut out. Um, and in fact, those drawings now are being um, sent to a computer, um, what's it, CD? Pro CNC, you know, the, CNC, the, the, um, the laser processors, so that they can cut out, be cut out by laser. Um, but everything starts out as, um, as a rather beautiful sketch made with a pencil. Um, can I, I um, in the um, gap between other questions, you, all, all three of you are educators in some way. Um, you at Sarah Lawrence teaching dance and theater. And um, Baz and Adrian, you actually began teaching using your puppets in schools. And I'm wondering if you could um, say um, now uh, how you, how, what, what are some of the first things that, that, that a, a would-be puppeteer has to learn? What did you say, Dan? What would I say? <laughs> uh, uh, again, actually, it goes to what you were talking about, about the, what did you call it, the, 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 the vision, the hyper perception, mm. micro movement. No, mm. not the micro movement, but the way that we will iris in on things. Oh, extreme perception. Extreme perception. Uh, that you know, in a lot of times when I get uh, students who have never held a puppet before and they get it up there, they start like banging it around in a in a way that is like that the movement is not in the same scale as the puppet, and mm -hmm. so they think that because they're in a theater and they have to project to the back row, that that means that movement also needs to be big and projected. And what they don't realize is, is exactly that, that you, you kind of, when you see a puppet, you're, if it's very small and, and well lit, your, your attention kind of irises into that, and so you can get away with very minute movement. So I would say that that would be like the, the, the patience to do something tiny and, and quietly, I think. Mm. And the, the, um, the ability to trust the object as being a valid medium of expression. Mm. Um, you, you have to pass your trust from, give up your, your, your trust in yourself and put that trust into an object. Um, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, and, and, and once you start moving that object, always less is more. Um, to, to really believe in the object is, is something that only comes after um, two weeks of training and eight weeks of rehearsal. Then you're kind of ready to hear that. The, the puppeteers, in fact, don't really hear, trust the object uh, when you first start saying it to them. Um, you have to say it many times, and finally that trust starts to, um, starts, starts to happen. And the way that you can see it happening is when the puppet starts to do less, the puppeteer starts to do less. 
from a from a construction point of view, if if if, if that's also part of your question, Yvette, um, I I'm I'm an old-fashioned puppeteer. Uh, my mom was a puppeteer, and I learned uh, I learned from other other older puppeteers that jointing and and studying of the movement that is possible with a figure is very important, um, and. I, I believe that very strongly. I think that anybody, anybody wanting to go into, into puppetry design and construction does need to make themselves familiar with the classical puppetry construction. Um, because you can modify it when you know how it works. Um, but building a figure that moves well is almost more important than, um, than how it looks. Uh, because it, the, uh, the performance is really what the audience are going to engage with. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that Dan is also employing classical puppet um, joints. You, 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 yeah, you use the bunrak. There's a, there's a, I saw that neck joint. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think. I think. Well. So, it's, in other words, it's it's important to kind of understand when you're teaching a young puppeteer. I think that that there are three there are three areas. Um, this area is about. Um, directing objects, um, objects in, uh, in the theater. Um, this area is about an ability to make, to make joints um, and make, it's the sort of mechanics of the emotion. Um, and this area here um, is the um, understanding of movement and uh, the ability to uh, to put movement into something as a puppeteer. So there's the directional side of things, um, the mechanical side of things, and the performance side of things. And we, we are going to be teaching, a, a, running a workshop in, in London at the Barbican Centre in September, where we, in fact, are going to run three workshops simultaneously. And the people who are in each workshop will be able to see what's happening in the other workshops. Because... <laughs> We think very much of the, of the form as being a Gesamtkunstwerk form, a form that um, embraces many art forms. And you can only really do it well and understand it if you understand how they relate to one another. I, uh, I had a student, Eric Wright, who um, is a brilliant puppeteer now. And I asked him, uh, why, why are you interested in puppetry? And he, this is when he was like a first year student. He said, because I love theater, and I love art, and I love engineering, and I don't want to give any of it up. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I wonder if, the, yes, there's another question. Yeah, I have a question. Um, my question is, have you ever started a process and realized partway through the process that puppetry wasn't the best form to tell the story that you were trying to tell? And if so, what did you do? Did you forge ahead, or did you change your course? I think in, in, in part, uh, that has happened. Uh, so for instance, in Warhorse, there's a, there's a little six-year-old girl who, in the original production, was uh, a child who ran around the stage with a rather unfortunate um, puppeteer on his or her knees running around behind it, and two other puppeteers running with her, doing the head and the left and right. She was, she was a puppet, not a real girl. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, and and uh, it was really hard negotiating the, the Olivia stage, was, which is a huge stage, with this little girl. Um, and um, and we, we, we realized that it it was not the right thing to have a puppet try to be that little girl. We couldn't have the exuberance of a young child uh, with people that were, were shuffling behind the puppet with, on their knees. And so when we revisited the production, um, we, we, we brought in a real young girl. And also, um, in the original War Horse, there was live shadow puppet theater. Um, which was sort of done at the side over there. You could kind of, if you were sitting there, you could see that it was happening. It was happening on a huge screen up there. Yeah, there was a camera um, uh, recording simultaneously what was happening on the little screen and blowing it up big on this torn paper in the sky. But the poor puppeteers and actors were constantly tearing around backstage to be uh, suddenly in place to become shadow puppeteers. 
And one of the things about shadow puppetry is that it's very tiny. So any movement mm -hmm. is amplified hugely, and it was being amplified hugely. And again, uh, we, we had to admit that it was not the right um, thing to be doing in that play. And so we scrapped the live shadow puppetry and um, recorded the shadow puppetry as, um, uh, as part of the screen. And I'm a little bit sad to say that in the New York version, <laughs> <laughs> the shadow puppetry is gone altogether. <laughs> no, it's, it, there's, there's very, very beautiful, sophisticated animation there so now. So it's been replaced by animation. And, and when we said to the director, Tom Morris, we're rather sad to see the demise of the, puppet, uh, the shadow puppets, he said, well, you know, it was referring to something that no longer existed. Mm. Uh, it was a reference to that live puppet theater um, that really is not there any longer. So... Um, yeah, it happens, but fortunately it hasn't happened with the whole production. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, just but to, to add, uh, sorry. Dan has something. No, I, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wonder if there, if there are any more questions or if, ah, there is one coming. Thank you. Hi. It's a simple one. How many Joeys are there? Uh, in the world? Yeah, <laughs> yeah or an, an existing, well, I mean, puppets, joy oh. puppets. Um, for the production? Um, yeah, I mean, if there are there prototypes? I mean, I'm sure there are prototypes. The, the, but the, how many there did was you a prototype. Make? There was a prototype, but it was too big for the Joey character, mm -hmm. and it was too bulky for the Top Thorn character, so it had to be scrapped. Um, and it became part of the scenery. Um, it was broken up and put in underneath the stage. Uh, the, uh, there's a Joey in London. Uh, there's a Joey that goes and visits the Queen. There's, <laughs> there's a Joey here. There's a Joey uh, on its way to Canada. So there's four, I think. Um, and the original Joey, parts of the original Joey are still playing, but the body has been rebuilt because it was built for one season, and then it did two, and then it's done a, a thousand. And, um, and, and so it wears out. So when, when we build a new Joey now, it's a body and eight legs and two heads and two necks. Um, and uh, when there's a, a damage, sometimes the, you know, things do break, uh, they can whip a leg off and put one back on when you don't even notice. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if this is a moment um, where a poem knows it's done. <laughs> Um, uh, and um, is there, I, I see, somebody, are you uh, buying the painting? Or yes, you really are going to ask a question. Yeah. Yes. Could you come down to the mic, please? Thank you. You've got a question. Yes. Oh, OK. A... Yeah, sorry. Um, oh. Yes, uh, earlier you were, you were speaking about how you sort of, uh, when you were doing War Horse, you started to, you had to sort of learn how to, um, it, it changed your role because you had to communicate to the puppeteers you were working with what you had been doing for 30 years. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how you actually select performers. Do you look for people with puppetry skills or do you prefer to work with people that have none? Because I've heard some um, direct puppet directors and some companies actually prefer people with zero puppetry experience because mm -hmm. they find it's easier to sort of work with a blank canvas. And I was wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, it's... it's uh, um the, the, one of the very important things that we are asking of the, the, the people in an audition is can you work together with other people over a long period of time? Um, um, if, you're a, if you're a big, booming personality, um, it, we, we'd certainly be saying can you put that big, booming personality into a, a puppet? Um, and we also like to kind of mix it up in terms of who we cast. It's great to have a mix of people because I think dancers bring something to a puppet piece that, that a puppeteer might not bring. Um, whereas a puppeteer brings a tremendous amount of expertise and discipline. Um, there are other things that, that they might not have. So um, we've got aerialists, gymnasts, um, uh, movements specialists, people who are in dance theatre, puppeteers. It's a spectrum of, of people and um, 
it's a combination of, of skill and an ability to kind of subjugate yourself to this, this object. Um, Physical fitness and height. height. Yeah, um, height is uh, unfortunately, the horses are a certain height, and uh, <coughs> vertically challenged people don't make the grade sometimes. <laughs> Uh, I, I was just wondering what you had to do to get into one of those workshops that were going to be happening in September. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Who do I have to kill? <laughs> we, we, um, you, have to, you have to pester uh, your agent, you have to pester the Lincoln Center casting No, he's talking about the one in London that oh, you in, talked about. Oh, in London. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I wasn't... I thought you were talking about uh, casting workshops. I wasn't too sure exactly what the workshops were. Were they specifically for Warhorse? No, they're to... not. No, they're not, right? That's not. what I had assumed, yeah. that they were just for Handspring, and mm. that's... I'm very interested, so... Uh, in, in, I don't... In, in it, I'll, I will fly to London and oh. find a place to live. <laughs> Shall we? <laughs> okay. no, I will just swim. Send, 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 send your info. I'm sorry, what's that? Send your details and then and, oh. and, and see what happens. Okay, I will. It'll be, it'll be part of, it'll be a Barbican Centre project. Um, and um, and uh, just watch their, their website. It'll, it'll come on the website and then apply and say, you were the person who... <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> but in general, we, we do, people sometimes say to us, what do we have to do to be part of this production? And the answer is, you have to be absolutely determined um, to get a place. And, I'm sorry, and said, usually, d determination, um, we find, is what gets you there. And you said it was, bar I couldn't in, quite understand. What in you, the workshop or in the, in the production? No, for the name of the, of who's... <laughs> Barbican. The Barbican. Barbican. Oh, it's the Barbican. A Barbican is, a, is the name of a theatre. Okay. Yeah, okay. Barbican. They're, they're, it's an arts complex. It's a big theatre. Okay. Lots of theatres. Okay. Um, they, um, and was there one more question? Yes. Yes, you came there. And then perhaps we'll... Put, yes. I'll make okay. it quick, everybody. Thank you. Um, when you were casting for the people who ride on top of the horses, did, did, you, um, did you create the horses with weight specifications on how much they could take? For the for the riders, uh, we, we, I mean, we would like those act, those roles to be played by somebody fairly petite who can like project a bigger personality than their size because the weight is an issue. Um, but it's not uh, so. I don't think it's 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 absolute criterion. But you know, it's a relief if the person is not too big. Um, the, each puppeteer is carrying about 20 kilos of uh, their share of a 40 kilo weight of the horse. And then when you put an actor on, it's uh, half of the weight of the actor plus uh, added to that. So about s up to 60 kilos uh, uh, on their back, and um, that's a lot. The scenes aren't long, but uh, it, it, it is physically grueling. Mm. But large people have been cast as people who ride the horses. It's, it's ultimately not... The, you ride the horse for five minutes at the most, um, so the poor puppeteers have just got to deal with whoever is cast in that role. We do have physiotherapists. In, in Actually, I, I spoke to one of the puppeteers, and he said that the, the real issue was not the weight of the person, but was the way that the person was uh, distributing their weight right. on the horse yeah. that was sometimes the challenge. Yeah, and yeah. a quick shift, like if, 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 if the actor overbalances the wrong way, um, that can put her back out. Oh. Mm. Well, they are troopers. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Just thank the the Vera List Centre for organising this, and Karen Coney and Annie, and thanks to the magicians, three of whom here remind us how far more complex our minds are, and they let the big secret out that all the big movie stars kind of mask from us, and that is any kind of artistic work is always an act of collaboration. Yeah. Thank you very much.